Okay, so we're going to talk about hormones that act on the kidney first. And then, after that, we're going to talk about hormones that the kidney makes. First of all, hormones that act on the kidney. First one I'm going to talk about, we just talked a ton about, so it's, just, it's going to be a nice test for you. What is the trigger for secretion of angiotensin 2? What is the very original trigger? The original trigger is decreased blood pressure. Okay. And eventually, so you get angiotensin 2, what's going to happen? What's going to be the response? Well, response in the kidney. Increased sodium reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tube over and that's the direct effect and then in the collecting ducts and that's through aldosterone and the other thing it does is it causes efferent arterial constriction okay and finally you get the peripheral vessel vasoconstriction so those all the effects of our angiotensin 2 next hormone is aldosterone we just talked about it but what's the trigger Trigger is, again, it's angiotensin 2 in response to decreased blood pressure. Okay, and then aldosterone will, uh, microscopically, what, what is it going to do? Where is it going to act specifically in the tubules? Um, so, let's see. Angiotensin 2 acts here. Where does aldosterone act? Aldosterone acts here in the collecting ducts, and what does it do? Remember, it causes increased sodium reabsorption in exchange for H plus and potassium secretion. And then next is ADH. What is the trigger for ADH? The trigger for ADH is increased plasma osmolarity. It's not, it's not blood volume. It's not decreased blood pressure. It's increased plasma osmolarity. Again, remember, osmolarity and water are so closely related. Water follows osmolarity. If you have increased plasma osmolarity, you want to decrease that. You want to increase. You want to get that water back into the blood. So that's why you get ADH. And so, how will ADH work? I just told you. I think you it works in the collecting ducts. On the collecting ducts, increases aquaporin channel insertion and thus increases water reabsorption. Next is atri atrial natriuretic peptide. Barely talked about this, talked about it a lot in the cardiac section. Nice review. What is the trigger for secretion here? Where the trigger for secretion is atrial pressure. And basically, it tells you you have volume overload, you have too much fluid in your vessels. And so, how is it going to act? What is it going to do? Basically, it's going to do two things it's going to lower blood pressure by, it's going to increase natriuresis and diuresis in the kidney. So that it's going to make you pee more, get, you, get rid of sodium, pee out the sodium, and then you're going to get peripheral vasodilation. Okay, It's very kind of opposite of angiotensin 2. They work in opposite directions. Okay, Angiotensin 2 increases your blood pressure. Atronetriuretic peptide decreases your pl blood pressure, decreases volume overload. Finally, parathyroid hormone also acts on the kidney. Okay, What is the triggers for parathyroid hormone? Well, it's pretty much the opposite of what it normally does. So low calcium or increased plasma phosphate both trigger parathyroid hormone. Okay. The other thing that triggers it is decreased vitamin D because vitamin D normal, normally blocks parathyroid hormone. So what's going to happen is what parathyroid hormone does is it decreases phosphate reabsorption in the, in the proximal cumulative tubule. And it's going to increase calcium resorption in the distal convoluted tubule. Okay. So, PTH here and here. Okay. And the other thing it does is it increases activated vitamin D. And that's all going to help promote calcium reabsorption. And vitamin D also promotes phosphate absorption. So now let's go into the kidney endocrine functions. There's four of Four hormones that the kidney really makes or is involved in making. Number one is EPO, erythropoietin. EPO helps stimulate red blood cell production in the bone marrow. And the reason why the kidney releases it is there's cells in the peritubular capillary bed. They're going to sense hypoxia, which means there's not enough blood. And so that means you need more red blood cells to carry more oxygen. Um, and so they're going to release EPO. EPO stimulates red blood cell production in the bone marrow. Okay, so kidneys make EPO. Number two is prostaglandins. Renal, the kidneys will make prostaglandins and those do a little paracrine secretion. So it'll be just like little local, local diffusion of it. 
and it's going to cause vasodilation of the afferent arterial. Remember, prostaglandins dilate the arterial, um, the afferent arterial. So that prostaglandins are actually made paracrinely in the kidney. Next is dopamine. Dopamine is made by para PCT cells, proxim proximal convoluted tuber cells, promotes naturesis. And at low levels, it's going to dilate afferent and efferent arterioles, increases renal blood flow, and while GFR is going to be the same, remember. It's going to be the same because the, the ratio is going to be the same. Um, I mean, it's not the ratio. It's because you increase flow inflow, but you're also increasing outflow, so GFR is going to stay constant, uh, even though you have increased renal plasma blood flow itself. And then at higher levels, dopamine naturally leads, leads to vasoconstriction. So finally, we have vitamin D. Vitamin D, the kidney is, is responsible for converting 25 OH vitamin D3 to 125 2-hydroxylated vitamin D3. Okay, that's the active form of vitamin D. And let me just reveal this whole vitamin D synthesis because I kind of forgot it. So how do you get vitamin D? Two methods, dietary or through the skin, through the sun. Okay, sun in the skin or diet including milk, some fatty fish, cheese, eggs all cause you to you to have some vitamin D3. But vitamin D3 is not active yet. First, it needs to be hydroxylated in the liver. And this number, this 25 year, just is refers to the, remember how in OCHEM you had all those carbons, you had the number of those carbons? Well, vitamin D3 happens to have a lot of carbons, and this one means you're gonna hydroxylate carbon number 25, okay? So this is the hydroxylate, and it's, it's on carbon number 25. And that's in the liver, that's number one, step, step number one. Step number two, you need a second hydroxylase, and that's in the kidney. One alpha hydroxylase in the kidney leads to the activated form, 125. OH2 vitamin D3. Honestly, you don't have to remember these numbers. Just remember, just know that these each each number represents a calcium that's hydroxylated. Your activated one needs to have two of these numbers, so one and twenty-five. Okay, you don't really have to pay attention too much to these enzymes. I think they're a lower yield, but know that kidney is responsible for getting the activation of that vitamin D3. So that's it for the hormones that act on the kidney and the kidney's endocrine functions. We're gonna go on to pathology now.